What I'm trying to do in these lectures is to articulate a clear Christian view of what it means to talk about the forgiveness of sins. As I said in the first lecture, these words, the forgiveness of sins, occur in the Apostles' Creed. But they are the only words from the Apostles' Creed that have some sort of currency in secular and everyday language. That is a challenge, but also a threat. The threat being that this language, severed from its Christian connection, will then um, have a sort of currency that drags us back from a clear Christian understanding, and indeed it begins to affect uh, how as Christians we think of the forgiveness of sins. So the idea is to try to formulate a clear Christian view, not so that we can then retreat into an ecclesiastical ghetto, but so that we can confront the world in all Christian clarity. Now last week I dealt with the Old Testament and said that the forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament occurs within the special relationship the special relationship that God has created with his people. And I pointed out that although there is a sacrificial system in the Old Testament, and we discussed that afterwards, a sacrificial system that was there to deal particularly corporately with those liminal situations in the life of the people that concerned death, ritual impurity, and so on, when it came to individual uh, moral faults and failings, the sacrificial system did not cover them. And we looked at the example of David, who, having committed adultery and attempted murder, um, and having confessed his sin after the prophet Nathan had spoken to him, is then simply told um, that God has put away your sin. And so we then turned to the Psalms, which deal considerably with the forgiveness of sins, um, and we quoted, of course, from that great Psalm number 51, Thou desirest no sacrifice, else would I give it thee. The sacrifice of God or a broken heart, a contrite spirit, O Lord, wilt thou not despise. We need, therefore, to bear this in mind when we come to the teaching of Jesus, because the teaching of Jesus, not surprisingly, is deeply rooted in the soil of the Old Testament and of uh, Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament. I shall argue that the teaching of Jesus goes well beyond that. But we have to start from a proper Old Testament understanding of things and clear our minds of what I called last week the sort of thinking that derives from sort of Catholic and Calvinist um, opinions that wants to see the death of Jesus purely in sacrificial terms. And the teaching of Jesus will make no sense at all if we come at it in that way. And I just want to focus on this issue by talking about something that happened to me so long ago that it was before the time even that I became a student. I was having a conversation with an Anglican clergyman who was maintaining that God was not able to forgive anybody's sins until Jesus had died on the cross to satisfy the demands of the law after which God could forgive. And I asked him to comment on the words from the Psalms, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he set our transgressions from us. In reply, he began by denying that the words came from the Psalms. Unfortunately, I hadn't got a Bible to hand to show him that they come from Psalm 103. He insisted that they came from Isaiah, <coughs> that they were a prophecy, and therefore they were looking forward to the future when God would be able uh, to forgive sins because Jesus would have paid the sacrificial price. Now, it, it is rather, rather a shame 
that people have to ignore the meaning of the Bible in order to fit it into their preconceived notions. But this is a deeply rooted idea, and uh, the famous hymn by Mrs. Alexander, uh, which I make sure that we don't sing here on Good Friday, uh, has the verse, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Point one, therefore, on the handout is that when Jesus illustrates forgiveness, he uses illustrations drawn from financial indebtedness. I quote uh, the parable in Matthew 18, 23 to 35, um, and it begins, you remember, with Peter coming to Jesus saying, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. And goes on to tell a parable of the kingdom of heaven where a king has two servants, both of whom owe money. One to the king, uh, the other to the servant. And you'll remember the, the parable because the first servant owes a ridiculously enormous sum of money. Uh, the king orders the servant, um, his goods to be sold and his family to be sold and so on. Uh, begs mercy from the king and the king forgives him. That same servant then goes off and um, treats a fellow servant who owes him a trifling sum of money um, with appalling severity. And of course, when that is reported back to the king, uh, the king is angry um, and, um, and punishes the um, servant appropriately. But this um, is in order to illustrate the point um, that if you do not, if you are not willing to forgive people yourself, <coughs> then God will not forgive you. Now, First of all, of course, it is quite clear uh, that that in itself makes nonsense of the idea uh, that God can only forgive if Christ has paid the penalty for sin, because if, it's, if that is the case, then it, God can only forgive if the penalty has been paid, but that doesn't apply to us. We, we are supposed to be able to forgive, and that's a condition of God forgiving us, and so I don't have to demonstrate the absurdity of this. And this leads us to, as I say on the handout, the important and far-reaching implications of what this means for understanding sin and the teaching of Jesus. And I refer here to Ernst Lohmeyer's book, uh, Das Vater Unser, uh, English version, The Lord's Prayer, where there is a very important section uh, discussing the whole business of, um, of for forgive us our sins. I'll come on to that in a moment. But he makes the point that Indebtedness is not the breach of a legal code, but a failure within a relationship. If money is owed, money is owed within the context of a relationship. And if there is a default, then this is a betrayal of the relationship, a failure within the relationship, but it takes place within a relationship and the forgiveness of the debt occurs within a relationship, you see. And we don't expect to say, well, look, th this debt can only be forgiven if somebody pays the price. I mean, we are familiar with debt being written off. And there is all the difference in the world, therefore, between the image of the law court and the image of the forgiving of the debt. In the law court, the offender has offended against some abstract legal code. And the judge acts not within the context of a relationship, but in order to uphold the justice that that breaking of the code has, um, has broken. 
and not surprisingly, if you follow that image up, then you have to ask, well, there is a penalty to be paid for, for breaking the law, um, and, and if, the, um, if, if the guilty person can't meet it, there's got to be some sort of punishment. This is quite different from the whole dynamic of thinking in terms of the forgiveness of a debt which takes place within the context of a relationship. And to that extent, therefore, this teaching of Jesus is fully within the context um, of forgiveness in the Old Testament, which takes place within the context of that special relationship which God has created. I want to move on, therefore, from that to Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. Now, here in the Abbey, we say... Um, the Lord's Prayer, as it appears in the Book of Common Prayer, uh, and we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. If you have ever been to a Presbyterian service in Scotland or an American service, you might be surprised uh, to come across people who, when they say the Lord's Prayer, do not use the prayer book version, but the version in the authorised version. And they pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And transgressions that we have in the prayer book actually goes back uh, to Tyndale. Um, and I've spent a very interesting um, and fruitless uh, a few hours the last couple of days uh, trying to discover why Tyndale translated it as trespasses. Because um, the, even the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Authorised Version, Revised Version, Moffat, RSV and NRSV, I list all those, all have debts, which is what the Greek word ophilemata means. And although Luke has in his version hamartia, um, forgive us our sins, he then follows it by saying, uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who are indebted to us, back to this um, ophilemata um, word and, and the stem underlining it, um, in terms of debts. So, as I say, I, I, don't, I don't know why um, Tyndale has, um, has trespasses um, in the language of the 16th century, um, a trespass uh, means not, of course, uh, uh, invading somebody's property um, uninvited. It means uh, crossing a particular line, uh, perhaps failing in a particular obligation. Um, but it is interesting that the, these versions um, come up with, with debts, and that takes us back to, to point one. The importance of thinking and forgiveness in terms of the remission of debts and not in terms of satisfying the judge who is presiding in a law court. Now I want to move from that to two passages um, which are very interesting um, because uh, their provenance in the New Testament textual tradition um, is disputed, one much more than the other, and to ask why this might be so. On the cross, Jesus asks God to forgive his executioners. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I looked through a number of translations, and the only one of the translations that I looked through that actually brought out the proper continuous force of the Greek word elegen uh, was J.B. Phillips. Because although in Greek there are um, what we call aspects. There are languages, particularly the Slavonic languages, Russian and Polish, that have aspects, which means um, different verbal forms that define whether an action is happening once or whether it is a continual um, action. So, for example, in, in Polish, um, you use one particular verb. Um, if, if you say, um, I'm, I'm going to the station now, uh, and a different verbal form, chodit, as opposed to iden, um, if you mean every morning I go to the station. So this distinction um, uh, that we call aspects between um, uh, some, an action that happens once and something that keeps on happening is represented occasionally in Greek, and it is here 
because elegen is the imperfect of legain, and it means Jesus said continuously. If he'd said it once, it would have been ipen, uh, Jesus said. But this is elegen, and it, oddly enough, they own, only Phillips brings this out. Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do. And I, and I think that's quite significant. It wasn't just once, although it is the first word from the cross. Um, if, if we're to understand the Greek, um, Jesus kept on saying it as he was being um, nailed to the cross. But it is not present um, in some important manuscripts. And therefore you may have a modern um, translation of the Bible that prints the verse, but may put some double lines either side. I've got an NRSV. Um, I, 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 I won't bother to, to look in my RSV here to see what they do. And uh, I mean, I, I, I've got with me a, a copy of the Greek New Testament, again, where, where the verse is placed in brackets. So we have to ask the question, was this verse left out accidentally or deliberately, or was it put in? And a very strong case can be made for the view that the verse was left out. And it was left out because people found it offensive. Here is somebody being nailed to the cross, and what is he doing? He's saying, not once, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. How on earth can anybody do that? And, and another view is, well, although Jesus, of course, is not being crucified by Romans, uh, but by Jews, or he's being crucified by Roman soldiers, uh, there is this sort of deep association in Christian thinking that the Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus. Um, and so some people think that um, it was left out because this could be said to be... Um, shedding, taking responsibility for doing this away from the Jews. But whatever it is, um, and, and, and we don't know for certain, but I find very persuasive the argument that this verse, very, very early on in the Greek New Testament copying manuscript tradition, um, what was offensive and therefore was left out because it was so radical. And then we come to... Number four, um, the story whose um, textual evidence is even, even less firm than that of uh, the first word from the cross, uh, the story of the woman taken in adultery, uh, which comes at the end of um, John 7 and into um, John 8, but also occurs in Luke, within the Lucan passion narrative, um, and uh, commentators point out that the language of this story is much closer to that of Luke than to that of John. But you'll remember how the story goes. Um, a woman is brought to Jesus who has been caught in the act of adultery um, and he is to pronounce on her. And, uh, of course, there are all sorts of uh, side issues here. Uh, after all, where is the man? Um, how was it that the woman was discovered, but, but not the man? After all, the Old Testament law is quite clear. Both are equally guilty. Um, has the woman been put up? Has she been paid in order to come along and, and um, you know, uh, be, be the object of this, this test for Jesus? But you remember what Jesus does. He, um, he says, let him that with a, is out sin cast the first stone. And this goes back to the point, of course, that in cases of adultery, um, the adulterer, adulterer the, these people are to be stoned to death. And stoning um, is rather a gruesome business um, of the person um, being put down into a pit and huge boulders being pushed down onto them, and it is the job of the witnesses uh, to be the first people to push these boulders down. Uh, if ever you saw the film The Life of Brian, um, there is a very good um, enactment um, of, of that. I, mean, I won't, won't go into it. Um, so the point is that, that Jesus does not condemn the woman. And Jesus in the story appears to forgive the woman and to say to her simply, does anybody condemn you? No, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, we're faced with the same problem. Why was it that this story um, 
seems to have floated around within the gospel tradition um, and finished up um, in a very few manuscripts in Luke and in a few more um, in John. And it may well again be the difficulty of coming to terms with a story like this, which appears to show an attitude of Jesus that, that goes quite against what people feel should be a moral administering of the, of the law. So, I think it's fascinating that we have these two passages, uh, both of which seem to have had problems in the manuscript tradition. Well, now we move on to, to something else um, in, in the last part of these items on the handout. Uh, number five, the presence of Jesus in the world inspires people to turn to him for help, sometimes involving forgiveness. Um, and you can look up these stories um, at your leisure. Uh, Mark 2, 1 to 11, of course, is the story about the friends of the paralytic um, bringing the, the man to Jesus and letting him down um, through the roof. Um, and the first thing that Jesus says is, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then after that, he, uh, he heals the man. Um, and then, of course, this sparks off a controversy with the um, Jewish um, authorities there um, who say, of course, Jesus does not have authority to forgive sins. But um, the interesting thing in, in the case of Mark 2 is it is the faith of other people bringing um, this, this man to Jesus that, that also works. Um, and you, you can read some of the other um, incidents here. Now, as we come to the items six, seven, and eight, we begin to move out, if you like, of, of the Jewish embeddedness of the teaching of Jesus on, um, on forgiveness into something that is much more radical. And I refer to the parable of the prodigal son and the elder brother because both are important in understanding this parable. I have mentioned to um, some of you before that in my Durham days, um, I was asked to give a talk on the parables of Jesus um, in um, a part of Sunderland, East Harrington. And I've never forgotten the fact that there was a woman present who was deeply upset by this parable because she had... Um, affected her career, uh, marriage, by devoutly nursing um, uh, her, her mother. And she felt that this was grossly unfair, that the elder brother, who has done all the good and right things, seems to be at a disadvantage when, it, when compared with the prodigal son. Now again, I have read sermons that try to rubbish the elder brother, you know, he, was a, he, he wouldn't have enjoyed a party, even if somebody had given a party for him. He was a real spoil sport. He just sort of you know, got on with his work. But we mustn't do that. We've got to allow um, full credit to the elder brother by staying at home, by doing his work, by contributing to the, um, the, the family income and the family farm. We've, we've got to, to, to make full allowance for that. And then to see in the father's treatment of the, of the prodigal um, a sort of radicality um, that tells us about the morality of grace, which is active in the ministry of Jesus. Because the action of the father in the power of the prodigal takes place within a relationship. This, my son, was dead and is alive again, was lost, and is found. And it may seem to go against all our normal ideas of loyalty, reward, whatever, that the father should see the son from afar off, should run to meet him, should order all these celebrations, and to say, this, my son, was dead and alive again, was lost and is found. And yet, this is what the morality of grace is about, and it runs so contrary to what we rightly think is 
good, responsible behaviour that we would all want uh, to emulate looking after elderly people, caring for others and so on. So that if we cannot understand this parable, it is precisely because there is active here the, a morality of grace with radical implications for the world in which we normally live. And we're beginning to get a glimpse here, I think, um, of, of what is going to happen when we arrive at a Christian idea of the forgiveness of sins and confront the world of normal, proper relationships with that morality of grace. Now, when we come to the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, we have something rather similar. Again, I have heard sermons and read sermons in which the Pharisee is rubbished. He was a hypocrite, um, and you know, he prayed with himself, of course, as it says in the story, um, and, and we, we've, re he, we, we've really got to, to rubbish him. No, we mustn't rubbish them. If we'd wanted to invite either of these two people to a party, it would have been the Pharisee we would have invited to one, not, not, not the publican. The Pharisee was, was a decent, honest, upright man, even if he was a bit um, self-confident and um, self-boasting about himself. And it is the publican, the tax collector, the man who daren't lift up his eyes unto heaven, who goes down justified. Uh, and I came across a fascinating comment on this in, um, in T.W. Manson, who says that th there's a paradox here, the publican confesses that he is guilty, yet he is the one who goes down to his house justified. And notice that word justified because although it is a, a complicated, uh, a perfect participle, um, it comes from that same dikaios root in Greek that is all about being righteous and justified. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So, we have again this radical view of things that within the relationship that God has with his people, um, forgiveness works in rather odd ways. Now, I want to come on to number eight, the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Because again, there is something odd, certainly in the parable of the shepherd who having lost one sheep, leaves the 99 and goes to look for it. This is irrational behaviour, because who is going to look after the 99 sheep? The 99 sheep are going to be left defenceless. Robbers, wolves may come um, and, um, and devastate the flock. This makes no sense at all. He's still got 99 sheep, so why is he bothering about one? And the remarkable thing about those, these parables is that they afford us a glimpse, and I put the word glimpse um, in inverted commas because when we're talking about God's feelings, we can only do this through imperfect human language and we mustn't project our feelings and emotions onto, onto God. But I've said before in, um, in, in sermons here, and this doesn't go back to me, it goes back to a marvellous book by Oliver Quick, um, the experience of losing something enables us to understand these parables. We have all lost something at some time in our life, and even if it was a very unimportant, trivial thing, we've felt a sense of incompleteness. Um, a sense of incompleteness out of all proportion to the fact that we hadn't lost 99.99% you know, of the rest of our possessions. And we, we look for the thing, the, the, the pen or, or whatever it is, we, we, we look for it. And when we find it, we have a satisfaction, a joy, that is out of all proportion to how insignificant this lost object is, um, and certainly in relation to all the things that we hadn't lost at all. And as the parable says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who needs, um, who, who repents, as opposed to 99, who needs no repentance. And this interesting tie-up with human experience of, of losing things perhaps gives us some sense of what is going on in the whole business of the radicality 
of the morality of grace. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned, um, but I refer back um, to number three on the handout, and that is the penitent thief on the cross. Um, a big question that keeps coming up with regard to forgiveness is, what does penitence mean? And, of course, we are used in our liturgies um, to saying, um, you know, make us sorry for our sins, or we say that, that we are sorry for our sins. And I don't see in these incidents that I've spoken about that, that feeling sorry is necessarily a factor in, in all this. And it is rather, as I say, at the bottom of number three, Jesus forgives the penitent thief whose penitence does not involve feeling so much sorry so much as recognising who Jesus is. Strictly speaking, of course, to repent, taking it back to its Hebrew origins, shuv means to turn. It's not about feelings, it's not about adjusting, well, it might be about adjusting mind, but it's about changing course, altering course. And it is about altering course, in the case of the Old Testament, back to God within the context of the special relationship. In the case of Jesus dealing with people, it is to recognise that in Jesus there is hope where elsewhere there is no help. That is, hope. That is certainly what the, the thief on the cross um, seems to perceive. So we are finding ourselves then within the context of the special relationship and now, however, given an edge by this radical outworking of what I call the morality of grace. So we have to come on to nine, which is desperately important. The one element of truth in theories about God not being able to forgive unless there's some price, some sacrifice paid, the element of truth in that is that divine forgiveness is costly, but it's not costly um, in the way we think it is. It is costly in a different way. We're coming up in a couple of weeks to uh, Holy Week and Good Friday, and we shall think about um, the passion of Jesus. But in the passion of Jesus, I would argue, Jesus does not suffer the wrath of God which is the necessary condition for God to be able to forgive. What Jesus does is that he confronts the wickedness of a world and a human race under the domination of evil. And by entering into confrontation with evil and sin in those ways, he robs them of their power to say the last word. He does unlock the gate of heaven, to come back to Mrs. Alexander's phrase, but not in the way that she thought. And when we come on to think about Paul next week, um, we shall see that the most common understanding that Paul has of the meaning of the death of Christ is that it confronts and defeats what he calls the principalities and the powers, who for once overstep themselves, who think that they are going to have the last word and discover the enormous mistake that they have made. So we move away from the idea of the courtroom. We move into the sphere of financial indebtedness and that then begins to make so much more sense of the Bible and hopefully of ourselves.